Hardware Interrupts. In this post, we set up the programmable interrupt controller to, co to correctly forward hardware interrupts to the CPU. To handle these interrupts, we add new entries to our interrupt descriptor table, just like we did for our exception handlers. We will learn how to get periodic timer interrupts and how to get input from the keyboard. This blog is openly developed on GitHub. Okay. Overview. Interrupts provide a way to notify the CPU from attached hardware devices. So instead of letting the kernel periodically check the keyboard for new characters, a process called polling, the keyboard can notify the kernel of each key press. This is much more efficient because the kernel only needs to act when something happened. It allows faster reaction time since the kernel can react immediately and not only at the next poll. I guess it depends on how quickly you're polling, right? without having to switch into interrupt context and handle the um, handle the key. But it just means if you're polling, you can't do anything else. So I think that might be a more relevant comparison, being able to do other things while waiting for the keyboard to be pressed. So you, you, you don't have to sit there waiting, pulling on the keyboard. You can actually do other things with your the CPU until the keyboard says, hey, I've got something. Um, okay, connecting all hardware devices directly to the CPU is not possible. Instead, a separate interrupt controller aggregates the interrupts from all devices and then notifies the CPU. Most interrupt controllers are programmable, which means that they support different priority levels for interrupts. For example, this allows, allows you to give timer interrupts a higher priority than keyboard interrupts to ensure accurate timekeeping. Unlike exceptions, hardware interrupts occur asynchronously. This means that they are completely independent from executed code and can occur at any time. Thus, we suddenly have a form of concurrency in our kernel with all the potential concurrency related bugs. Rust's strict ownership model helps us here because it forbids mutable global state. However, deadlocks are still possible as we will see later in this post. The 8259 PIC. The Intel 8259 is a programmable interrupt controller, PIC, introduced in 1976. It has long been replaced by the newer APIC. What does the A stand for? But its interface is still supported on current systems for backwards compatibility uh, reasons. Looks like it stands for advanced. The 8259 PIC is significantly easier to set up than the APIC, so we will use it to introduce ourselves to interrupts before we switch to the APIC in a later post. The 8259 has eight interrupt lines and several lines for communicating with the CPU. The typical systems back then were equipped with two instances of the 8259 PIC, one primary and one secondary PIC connected to one of the interrupt lines of the primary. Okay, so the second interrupt con secondary controller tells the primary controller and the primary controller tells the CPU so if a secondary interrupt happens, I guess is it just a, a layer of indirection that gets you, you know, seven more entries, although two are available, it looks like. This graphic shows the typical assignment of interrupt lines. We see that most of the 15 lines have fixed mapping, e.g. line four of the secondary PIC is assigned to the mouse. Each controller can be configured through two IO ports, one command port and one data port. For the primary controller, these ports are OX20 and OX21. For the secondary, they are OXA0 and OXA1. For more information on how the PICs can be configured, see the article on osdev.org. Okay, implementation. Oh good, we get right into the code. The default configuration of the PICs is not usable because it sends interrupt vector numbers in the range 0 to 15 to the CPU. These numbers are already occupied by CPU exceptions. For example, number 8 corresponds to a double fault. To fix this overlapping issue, we need to remap the PIC interrupts to different numbers. The actual range doesn't matter as long as it does not overlap with the exceptions. But typically the range 32 to 47 is chosen because these are the first free numbers after the 32 exception slots. Makes sense. The configuration happens by writing special values to the command and data ports of the PICs. I think this is what makes them programmable, right? You can tell it how to behave. 
Unfortunately, there is already a crate called PIC8259, so we don't need to write the initialization sequence ourselves. In case you're interested in how it works, check out its source code. It's fairly small and well documented. All right, we'll take a, a brief look here. Oh, do we have. Um, I guess we're we're on we're going to be using 10.1.0.10.1. This project is a fork of the simple crate. Okay. Yeah. And I guess here's in the source code is where we set things up. Oh, I see. So here's the initialize code, and they document all the reason all the all the things they're doing. To the writes. Do they do any reads during the initialization? No. Okay, that's neat. I wonder what the wait function does. How does it know how long to wait? I'm just looking for wait and I don't see a wait here. All right. Maybe it's. Hmm. Oh, here it is. I see it. It's a, it's a, it's a closure. Just says write zero and calls wait port. So maybe writing a zero doesn't return until the command has been written. You need to edit delay between writes to our PICs, especially on older motherboards, but you don't necessarily have any kind of timers yet because most of them require interrupts. Various older versions of Linux and other PC operating systems have worked around this by writing garbage data to port 80, OX80, which allegedly takes long enough to make everything work on the hardware. Okay. Oh, okay. Interesting. Right, so writing to that delays the CPU enough such that the next write can happen safely. Allegedly. <laughs> okay. That's great. Gotta love it. Um, the things we hack. Okay, um, let's see. To add the crate as a dependency, we add it to our project. Okay. Get status for clean, right? Yep. Oh, like, let's push this up. I should have pushed this up before I even finished the stream last time. Okay. Cargo Tommel. We're gonna add one more dependency here. Pick 8259. We're using the 1 version. The main abstraction provided by the crate is the chain depicts struct that represents the primary secondary PIC layout we saw above. It's designed to be used in the following way. So, okay, over in interrupts, we're gonna use it. And we're gonna use spin. We already have spin. Okay, so this is our uh, IDT stuff. Oh, there was a, um, I should I should learn that. Uh, all, all those shortcuts that I imported from Togglebit. Uh, cargo, not cargo. Config and Vim um, after FT plugin, Rust. There was, oh, it's not here. It must be somewhere else. Syntax? No. There's a, oh, Utila snips. That was it. Ulta snips. That was it. Uh, CMT for comment. Okay. Let's do that. Oh, it's not tab. CMT. CMT space? Nope. Why does it keep putting a tab in there? CMT. Huh. Okay, I don't know what Utila Snips is doing to me now. I forgot what the command was to actually make it happen. Interrupts. And this is going to be uh, PIC. This is actually IDT, right? And then this is the PIC. And I'll do both of them right here. Okay, so, whoops, let's get rid of those. Pub, const, ah, 
What did I do? Let's try again. Pub const pick one off one offset is u8. This is 32. Pub const pick two offset is u8. Pick one offset plus eight. Pub static picks is going to be a spin mutex. We could have just pulled that in directly, right? Chained picks. Did we actually have it already? No, we don't. Okay. Uh, spin. Mutex. New. Unsafe. Chained picks. New. Pick one. Offset. Pick two. Offset. Okay. And it has to pull that in and build it. <clears throat> All right. We're setting the offsets for the picks to range 32 to 47, as we noted above. By wrapping the chain pick struct in a mutex, we're able to get safe mutable access through the lock method, which we will need in the next step. All right. So I missed... Um, Oh, because unsafe is supposed to be... I don't know why I did that. What else is failing? Uh, everything. Init IDT. Oh, okay. Because it failed to build. All right, there we go. So now it built. Very good. The chain picks new function is unsafe because wrong offsets could cause undefined behavior. Uh, or probably that it's accessing a pointer directly. We can now initialize uh, a, a, a location in memory directly. We can now in, in, we can now initialize the 8259 pick in our init function. Okay, so let's go back over here. Uh, we're gonna do unsafe, interrupts, picks, lock, initialize. We don't need that, right? Okay, we use the initialize function to perform the PIC initialization. Like the chain picks new function, this function also is also unsafe because it can cause undefined behavior if the PIC is misconfigured. If all goes well, we should continue to see it did not crash message when executing cargo run. Let's find out. I don't remember if I left that message in there. I did, it did not crash. Okay. Okay, so that was that. So this is the initial, that's the initialization done and now we need to enable interrupts. Until now, nothing happened because interrupts are still disabled in the CPU configuration. This means that the CPU does not listen to the interrupt controller at all, so no interrupts can reach the CPU. Let's change that. Okay. Um, I missed it. Okay. So we have GTC in it, interrupts in it. We have the unsafe thing here, and now we're going to do x86. 64, instructions, interrupts, enable. The interrupts enable function of the x86-64 create executes a special STI instruction, set interrupts, to enable external interrupts. When we try cargo run now, we can see that a double fault occurs. Blam. Didn't crash though. Source interrupts. Oh yeah, this this is where the panic is coming from, right? Source interrupts thirty five. Yeah, it's just a double fault handler. So it do, this doesn't really help us too much. We actually have to look at the stack frame in order to see where the actual panic occurred. Okay, 
and it tells us the instruction pointer, but then this isn't really mapped to anything. Okay. The reason for this double fault is that the hardware timer, Intel 8253 to be exact, is enabled by default. So we start receiving timer interrupts as soon as we enable interrupts. Since we didn't define a handler for function for it yet, our double fault handler is invoked. Handling timer interrupts. As we see from the graphic above, the timer uses zero on the primary PIC. That means it arrives at the CPU as interrupt 32. Zero plus offset 32. Instead of hard coding index 32, we store it in an interrupt index enu. Okay, so we're going to create a new enum, I guess. And we'll just call it timer. Um, and then we implement an as eight and an as u size. Wouldn't it be more rusty to implement it as a from trait or implement the from trait for it? I don't know. Um, hmm. Here's what I'm thinking. So it's a impl from interrupt index. For U8 from self. Oh no, so from interrupt index. Um, I, I. That's U8. Right, do it this way, and then we can just call into on it. That should build. We'll get warnings we're not using. Oh, no, because it's in a lib. But it builds. Okay, let, let's try that. And then as you size, it's the same thing, right? Let's just try it. And if it fails miserably, then it fails miserably. Um, and then in interrupts, we're going to use create print. print like this and then we're going to have a lazy static for the IDT oh in the IDT we're going to add set handler function I guess this is the un the, the dots here are probably referring to the unsafe block and we can say IDT interrupt index timer into I wonder if Rust would figure it out automatically. Let's find, try it without the into to as you size it and then set handler function timer interrupt handler. Uh, and then we have to write a timer interrupt handler, which we're going to put down here in the picks section. Extern x86 interrupt timer interrupt handler. Stack frame, interrupt stack frame, and it's just going to print it out. Let's see what happens. Yeah, expected U size. Okay, so can I do into on it now? I can. It would be nice if Rust could figure that out automatically, given that there is an implementation of into for interrupt index and U size. We're not using this one yet. I guess we will. Yeah, I want to do it this way, just because it seems it feels a little more rusty. Our timer interrupt handler has the same signature as our exception handlers because the CPU reacts identically to exceptions and external interrupts. The only difference is that some exceptions push an error code. The interrupt descriptor table struct implements the index mute trait so that we can access individual entries through an array indexing syntax. So that's this. That's why this worked. 
In our timer interrupt handler, we print a dot to the screen. As the timer interrupt happens periodically, we would expect to see a dot appearing on each timer tick. However, when we run it, we only we see that only a single dot is printed. Okay. Go run. Dot. It's very, very small, but it's there. A little tiny dot. Okay. End of interrupt. The reason is that the PIC expects an explicit end of interrupt signal from our interrupt handler. This signal tells the controller that the interrupt was processed and that the system is ready to receive the next interrupt. So the PIC thinks we're still busy processing the first timer interrupt and waits, waits patiently for the EOI signal before sending the next one. To send the EOI, we use our static picks struct again. So that means every timer function has to have this, right? Or sorry, every interrupt function has to have this extra block of code here at the end. Unsafe, picks, lock, notify, end of interrupt, interrupt index, timer, into. It would be nice if we can, we can take a look, but this would work. Yeah, expected U8. If we take a look at this, So the way to get that to work without the into would be to do something like this, right? And make this a T and then just put the into over here. Right? And that way we could call it, I'm not going to do this change. Obviously this is, this is part of the, um, the crate. So, but then I could call it with any type that uh, implemented into U8, which in our case is, is, is the enum. That's a, um, that's something that's, that's handy for, uh, if you're writing a library, um, you can make it easier for people to use your library by doing stuff like that. Okay. So this builds with the into. The notify end of interrupt figures out whether the primary or secondary PIC sent the interrupt and then uses the command and data ports to send an EOI signal to the respect to respective controllers. Okay. If the secondary PIC sent the interrupt, both PICs need to be notified because the secondary PIC is connected to an input line of the primary PIC. We need to be careful to use the correct interrupt vector number. Otherwise we could accidentally delete an important unsent interrupt or cause our system to hang. This is the reason that the function is unsafe. Again, I think the reason the function is unsafe is because we're writing directly to memory mapped hardware. When we now execute cargo run, we see dots periodically appearing on the screen. Okay. Let's see that. No, oh, look at that. This is about 10 times a second, maybe? Hard to tell. Mississippi 2, Mississippi 3, Mississippi 4, Mississippi 5, Mississippi 6. So it took six seconds about to get 80 characters out. I don't know what, what speed that is. All right, but it's about the same speed as this uh, animated GIF here. So I think we're, we're on the right track. Con Ooh, configuring the timer. The hardware timer that we use is called the Programmable Interval Timer, or PIT for short. Like the name says, it's possible to configure the interval between two interrupts. We won't go into details here because we will, we will switch the APIC timer soon, but the OS Dev Wiki has an extensive article about configuring the PIT. Okay, deadlocks. We now have a form of concurrency in our kernel. The timer interrupts occur asynchronously so they can interrupt our start function at any time. Fortunately, Rust's ownership system prevents many types of concurrency related bugs at compile time. One notable exception are deadlocks. Deadlocks occur if a thread tries to acquire a lock that will never become free. Thus, the thread hangs indefinitely. We can already provoke a deadlock in our kernel. Remember that our println macro calls the VGA buffer print function, which locks a global writer using a spin lock. It locks the writer, calls write format on it and implicitly unlocks it at the end of the function. I think it actually does it at the end of this statement, right? 
Now imagine that an interrupt occurs while the writer is locked and the interrupt handler tries to print something too. So start calls printlin, printlin locks writer, the interrupt handler happen, uh, kicks in, handler begins to run, it calls printlin, it tries to lock the writer but start has the writer locked and start won't ever unlock the writer until the interrupt handler returns but the interrupt handler return until won't return until it can grab the writer lock so that's a deadlock. I like step never unlock writer. The writer is locked so that the interrupt handler waits until it becomes free, but this never happens because the start function only continues to run after the interrupt handler returns, thus the complete system hangs. Provoking a deadlock. We can easily provoke such a deadlock in our kernel by printing something in a loop at the end of our start function. So we can just print hyphens in our start function and eventually the uh, timer will tick. We can see how many hyphens we get. Um, so here's our start function. We have to, it did not crash. And then down here inside the loop, I guess we have to comment this out now. Uh, we'll say use blog OS print and say print bang hyphen. And that'll print a whole bunch of dashes until the interrupt happens and then everything will hang. Right there. So we got eight lines of dashes and it just happened to hit that. So let's, let's, let's just run it a couple times to see. Because it should be random. There, there, there's one line, right? It, it all depends on when the timer interrupt happens, which could be at any time. It always, it always seems to be right at the end of the line. Is that because we're, we're pushing all the lines up at that point? So that's the longest will hold the lock for because we have to move everything on the screen up one line. That makes sense, right? So it's more likely, much more likely to happen at the end of the line than at the middle of the line like they're showing here. All right, we see that only a limited number of hyphens is printed until the first timer interrupt occurs. Then the system hangs because the timer interrupt handler deadlocks when it tries to print a dot. This is the reason that we see no dots in the above output. The actual number of hyphens varies between runs because a timer interrupt occurs asynchronously. This non-determinism is what makes concurrency-related bugs so difficult to debug. It's possible to get a dot, right? If we happen to get the interrupt while the writer is unlocked in the main loop, we could get the one a, a dot come out. It's very, very unlikely though, right? especially given the whole wrapping thing that happens here at the end of the line. But the reason we see no dots in the above output is that happened to hang um, while we were trying to print the dash, the hyphen. Fixing the deadlock. To avoid this deadlock, we can disable interrupts as long as the mutex is locked. So every time we print, we're going to disable interrupts. All right. So in VGA buffer, your underscore print function, uh, which is where? Oh, here. So instead of just writer write, write a lock write for blah blah blah, we'll okay use x86. I don't think this is the actual solution. They're just showing this as an example because this doesn't make sense to me to do it this way. So interrupts without interrupts. So we disable interrupts, we do the write, and then we re-enable interrupts after the, because this is a closure. So during the time of this closure, interrupts are disabled. We'll write out the, whatever it is we need to write, and then we resume interrupts at the end of that. And of course, it didn't work. because I typoed it. There we go. Okay, so let's try this. The without interrupts function takes a closure and executes it in an interrupt-free environment. We use it to ensure that no interrupt can occur as long as the mutex is locked. When we run our kernel now, we can see that it keeps running without hanging. We still don't notice any dots, but this is because they are scrolling by too fast. Try to slow down the printing, for example, by putting uh, 
Only 10,000? That's all we need to do? I mean, I can do that. I guess this doesn't get compiled out for whatever reason. It should be, right? <clears throat> I guess maybe if, since we're doing it, uh, a debug build. Yeah, okay, so we can see it. So 10,000 is, en is enough to slow this down enough. And we, now we can see the dots coming out periodically. Okay. Yes, I want to quit. We can apply the same chain. Oh, the other thing I wanted to see is now that we enabled interrupts, are we able to get, no, we don't have any menus still. Okay. So I'm not sure what allows the, the, those menus to work. Uh, we can apply the same change to our serial printing function to ensure that no deadlocks occur with it either. Okay. Um, so that's right over here. Ah, come on. So we just do that over here. That happens like this. Reformat, and that should work. Okay. Note that disabling interrupts shouldn't be a general solution. Yeah. The problem is that it increases the worst case interrupt latency, i.e. the time until the system reacts to an interrupt. Therefore, interrupts should only be disabled for a very short time. Okay, fixing a race condition. If you run cargo test, you might see the test print and output test failing. The reason is a race condition between the test end and our timer handler. Remember the test looks like this. We write a string and then we check this, the screen to see if those strings are on the screen. And if a dot happens, then a dot happens in the middle of that, right? Let's run to our test and see. The test prints out a string to VGA buffer and then checks the output by manually iterating over the buffer characters array. The race condition occurs because the timer interrupt handler might run between the print lint and the reading of the screen characters. Notice that this is an, a dangerous data race, which Rust completely prevents at compile time. To fix this, we need to keep the writer locked for the complete duration of the test so that the timer handler can't write a dot to the screen in between. The fixed test looks like this. Okay, so I guess we're gonna modify our um, test to disable interrupts during for the duration of the test, huh? Okay, so we're gonna grab a, the, the lock right away. Instead of locking it for every um, read. Oh, that's interesting. We're gonna use write line instead of print line to, to hold on to the writer, okay. Right, and then we have let s here, and then inside interrupts, without interrupts. I'm gonna get the writer. I'm gonna lock the writer. We're gonna use write lin. Uh, and then we have to expect. I don't know what's gonna happen there if that fails, but it shouldn't fail. Oh, I see. There's a new line in front of it. Okay. And then these shift over. And instead of writer lock, we're going to just say writer like that. Everything else remains the same. Okay. Um, and I missed this guy here. There we go. All right, so now if I run cargo test, it fails to compile. Um, oh, I forgot to pass in writer, duh. There, okay. 
So print line output was the test that was failing and now it's passing. Okay. We perform the following changes. We keep the writer locked for the complete test by using the lock method explicitly. Instead of println, we use writeln. To avoid another deadlock, we disable interrupts for the test section, test duration. Otherwise, the test might get interrupted while the writer is still locked. Since the timer interrupt handler can still run before the test, we print an additional new line before printing string s. This way we avoid test failure when the timer handler already printed some dot characters to the current line. With the above changes, the cargo test now deterministically succeeds again. This was a very harmless race condition that only caused a test failure. As you can imagine, other race conditions can be much more difficult to debug due to their non-deterministic nature. Luckily, Rust prevents us from data races, which are the most serious case class of race conditions since they can cause all kinds of undefined behavior, including system crashes and silent memory corruptions. The halt instruction. All right, so should we check in these changes? Um, printing uh, dash without deadlock and adding, uh, fixing uh, data race in the output test. Okay. Until now, we used a simple empty loop statement at the end of our start and panic functions. This causes the CPU to spin endlessly and thus works as expected, but it is also very inefficient because the CPU continues to run at full speed even though there's no work to do. You can see this problem in your task manager when you run your kernel, the QEMU process needs, to, needs close to 100% CPU the whole time. What we really want to do is to halt the CPU until the next interrupt arrives. This allows the CPU to enter the sleep state in which it consumes much less energy. The halt instruction does exactly that. Let's use this instruction to create an energy efficient endless loop. Oh, Fidakuk, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the raid. Dion Fix, thank you for the follow. Very cool. And Edison Mark 21, thank you for the follow. And uh, Kura Walker, thank you for the follow. And New Capital, thank you for the follow. Very much appreciated. Fernando, thank you. Thank you for the raid, Fernando. Very cool. What were you working on? I know you, you probably have to go, but uh, just curious what you were working on. Oh, Junior Martin XO followed. Thank you. Thank you for the follow. And Insanity75, thank you also for the follow. Whole bunch of new followers. Very, very exciting. All right, so we were in the middle of uh, trying to fix the endless loop so that it doesn't cause issues. Um, uh, with CPU use. So instead of doing this print loop, we're gonna change it to x86, 64, instructions, halt. And we just stay in this halt loop so that when the interrupt happens, we go back into halt. Uh, Fernando says, today I was just showing about React.js and TypeScript, but from Monday to Wednesday, I'm studying Rust on my stream. Oh, very cool. Um, I will have to give you a follow um, because I would like to see that. Um, let me see if I can do that from right here. I would like to see the, uh, the, the Rust learning, definitely. Uh, um, let's see. Where was I? Oh, okay, so... So let's use this instruction to create an energy efficient endless loop. The instructions halt function is just a thin wrapper around the assembly instruction. It's safe because there's no way it can compromise memory safety. Fair enough. Um, I guess they're, they're saying that's why we don't need to use the unsafe keyword. We can now use this halt loop instead of endless loops in our start and panic functions. Oh, I'm, oh I see, I, we're creating a new function here. I just changed this thing, but we're actually gonna change the, the start. All right, so let's do that. 
Um, I guess we don't need the clippy warning anymore. Blog OS, halt, loop. We'll just call that. And then this is gonna go into instructions, sorry, into lib. We'll add this loop as a new library function, I guess down here, sure. Halt loop. Bang here means it's a div diverging function, which means it never exits. It has no return value because it never exits. And then, so we're gonna use this in our uh, start function here. Oh, and then in the panic handler as well, okay. That's the test version of it. And here's the loop, okay, blog OS halt loop. Okay, so this should build. Do we have to add it to our test runner too? Let's up, yes, let's update our lib rs as well. Okay, so uh, in our start, here it is, here's the loop. So we can just say halt loop since it's right there and then test panic handler, which is over here. Okay, halt loop like that. It shouldn't get here because this should be a diverging function as well, but I don't think it's, yeah, it's not marked as one. It just writes the um, exit code to the um, exit port. And then we, I guess we just hope QEMU exits, but if it doesn't, then we have the halt loop. All right, so when we run our kernel now in QEMU, we can see much lower CPU usage. All right, we should, this should build, right? And I can do a cargo run. I'm not gonna run activity monitor because that's gonna be, but we're, we're getting the interrupts. Um, pretty slow, but again, I think it's just like 10 times a second or something like that. All right, so now we're gonna do keyboard input. Now that we're able to handle interrupts from external devices, we're finally ab able to add support for keyboard input. This will allow us to interact with our kernel for the first time. Uh, like the hardware timer, the keyboard controller is already enabled by default. So we're describing how to handle PS2 keyboards, not USB keyboards. The main board emulates USB keyboards as PS2 devices to support older software so we can safely ignore USB keyboards until we have USB support in our kernel. Um, USB support requires writing a whole USB driver. I, I, maybe there's a, a driver crate we can just pull in. I wouldn't want to write <laughs> from scratch a USB driver. Um, like the hardware timer, the keyboard controller is already enabled by default. So when you press a key, the keyboard controller sends an interrupt to the PIC, which forwards it to the CPU. The CPU looks for a handler function in the IDT but the corresponding entry is empty. Therefore, a double fault occurs. Oh, okay, so we should be able to see that if I type a key. Yes, so I just typed a key and we got the double fault. Quit. So let's add a handler function for the keyboard interrupt. It's quite similar to how we define the handler for the timer interrupt, it just uses a different interrupt number. Okay, so if we look at here, We have a new interrupt index called keyboard. Uh, and then we look at our interrupt descriptor table. We're gonna add a new keyboard and we're gonna change timer to keyboard interrupt handler. Okay. So that's the PIC. Here's a timer interrupt handler, and I guess we're gonna write now, we're going to write the keyboard interrupt handler, okay. Use the same function signature. We're gonna print just the letter K, okay. I guess until we can interpret what the keyboard key was. Like if we just do the same thing here, right? Except this is 
Zip timer, it's keyboard. Right? As we see from the graphic above, that's way above, that we looked at earlier, the keyboard uses line one of the primary PIC. This means it arrives at CPU as interrupt 33. So that's how, where this comes from. So this is 32, this is 33. We add this index as a new keyboard variant to the interrupt in index enum. We don't need to specify the value explicitly since it defaults to the previous value plus one, which is also 33. Yeah, so that's, that's just Rust being Rust. In the interrupt handler, we print a K and send the in, end of interrupt signal to the interrupt controller. We now see that a K appears on screen when we press a key. Oops. This fails because I forgot to call it. Okay, cargo run. So now I should be able to type some keys and see the letter K come out. Oh, only one K. I guess we have to actually read the key from the keyboard controller before it'll it'll send a signal for the next key. Okay. However, this only works for the first key we press. Even if we continue to press keys, no more Ks appear on the screen. This is because the keyboard controller won't send another interrupt until we have read the so-called scan code of the pressed key. Okay, reading the scan codes. To find out which key was pressed, we need to query the keyboard controller. We do this by reading from the data port of the PS2 controller, which is the IO port with the number OX60. Okay. So let's go back down here and go here. And now we're gonna add this. Okay, use x86, 64, instructions, port, port. I'm sure I didn't have that in here already? I did not, okay. Port is equal to port new. 16. These, these should be defined somewhere. We're using OXF4 as well, somewhere in another file apparently for exit QAMU. So this is going to be an unsafe port read. If I didn't put the U8 here, would it know what type that was? Xlafidix. <laughs> However you pronounce that, I apologize, but thank you for the follow. Let's see what it says. It says unknown. So we have to coerce it to a U8. I guess, what does port read return, right? Oh, it returns whatever type you tell it to return. Okay, fair enough. Okay. This is a port, right? Yeah, it says U8 right there. So port read should be U8. I shouldn't have to specify that. Oops. Okay, and then we're gonna print the scan code. And then um, notify end of interrupt. We use the port type of the x8664 create to read a byte from the keyboard's data port. This byte is called scan code. It is, a, it is a number that represents a key press release. We don't do anything with the scan code yet. We just print it on the screen. Okay. So it looks like we have a, a press and then a release. Press release, press release. Okay. It builds, cargo run. Let's see if we can see that. Okay, so I'm just gonna hit the letter A. B, C, D, E, F. And if I type really fast, they all get jammed together. Neat. Quit. Okay. The above image shows me slowly typing one, two, three. We can see that adjacent keys have adjacent scan codes and that pressing a key causes a different scan code than releasing it. But how do we translate the scan codes to actual key actions exactly? Interpreting the scan codes. There are three different standards for the mapping between scan codes and keys. The so-called scan code sets. Okay. All three go back to the keyboards of early IBM computers. The IBM XT, IBM 3270 PC, and the IBM AT. 
Later computers fortunately did not continue the trend of defining new scan code sets, but rather emulated the existing sets and extended them. Today, most keyboards can be configured to emulate any of the three sets. By default, PS2 keyboards emulate scan code, scan code set 1, XT. In this set, the lower seven bits of a scan code byte define the key, and the most significant bit defines whether it's a press, 0, or release, 1. Keys that were not present on the original IBM XT keyboard, such as the enter key on the keypad, generate two scan codes in succession an OXEO escape byte, and then a byte representing the key. For a list of all set one scan codes and their corresponding keys, check out the OS dev wiki. I'm not gonna look now. To translate the scan codes to keys, we can use a match statement. This seems awkward. I, mean, I don't wanna do one for every single key, but we can at least see how it's, um, how it's doing the job, right? By doing this code. So we can say, instead of this print here, we can say let key is equal to match scan code. Um, and then we can say OX02 is sum one. And then just put three, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, right? And then just change all these guys. Uh, what's the Vim key to increment a value? There's a, there's a way to do it in Vim to say increment the next value you see on the line. Nine and zero, okay. And then everything else just maps to none. And we can say if let sum key is equal to key, then we can just put key right there and then we're done. So we can at least see those 10 keys, right? Oops, uh, I forgot that. Okay, so cargo run this and we should be able to see at least those keys come out. All the other keys will be ignored. Like if I type in ASDF, nothing comes out. But if I type one, two, three, four, then we see one, two, three, four. Yeah. All right. But I don't think we want to do this for every key, right? The above code translate keys translates key presses of the number keys zero through nine and ignores all other keys. Uses a match statement to assign a character or none to each scan code. It then uses if let to destructure the optional key by using the same variable named key in the pattern we shadowed the previous declaration, which is a common pattern for destructuring option types in Rust. Now we could write numbers. Translating the other keys works in the same way. Fortunately, there's a crate named PC keyboard. Oh, good for translating scan codes, scan code sets one and two. So we don't have to implement this ourselves. To use the crate, we'll add it. Okay, let's do that right away. PC keyboard is equal to 0.5.0. Now we can use this crate to rewrite our keyboard interrupt handler. Okay. Do we want to do all this work in the interrupt handler is my question. Or do we want to just read the scan code and then put it in a queue and have some other keyboard thread in non-interrupt context handle it? I guess for now we're going to just do this. Um, so we have this use for the port, uh, use PC keyboard, layouts, decoded key, handle control, keyboard, and scan code set one. Uh, we're also going to use the spin mutex. So we're using a, muta a spin mutex in interrupt context. That's unhealthy. Mutex keyboard layouts. US 104 key scan code set one is equal to mutex new keyboard new layouts US 104 key scan code set one handle control ignore. I guess we're ignoring the control key. Is that what that means? And that's that lazy static there. 
I wonder why we're putting it in this scope. All right, so then we're gonna say let uh, the keyboard is keyboard lock. And we have the port still. We read the scan code here. And then we have an if let, an if let, and a match key. If let, okay, sum key event is equal to keyboard add byte scan code. Oh, it comes after the scan code. Keyboard add byte scan code, okay. If let sum key is equal to keyboard process key event, key event. This is an interesting uh, way to handle it, right? Because what, we, what we're doing, it looks like, is what we're doing is adding scan codes to um, something internal to keyboard, and it might return, a re it'll return a result, an okay of some result, or it might return a none, saying there's no key event yet. We still need more scan codes to come in. Uh, I'm just interpreting the way, the way I think this is working behind the scenes. And then here, we actually convert the key event into a key. And if it does convert into a key, then we can we have the decoded key value here. That's key, decoded key. So it's either a Unicode character, in which case we're gonna print it, bang. Or it's, it's a raw key, if it's not Unicode, and so in that case, what we're going to do is we're going to debug out, out, print out the key. And then we can get rid of this scan code stuff, and I guess we get rid of that as well. Okay, so that's not too, too bad. Um, we could clean this, this pyramid up a little bit, but there's only two layers. Key barred. Very good. I found the barred, everyone. All right. We use lazy static macro to create a static keyboard object protected by a mutex. We initialize the keyboard with a US keyboard layout and the scan code set one. The handle control parameter allows to map control to Unicode characters. We don't want to do that, so we use the ignore option to handle the control like normal keys. On each interrupt, we lock the mutex, read the scan code from the keyboard controller, and pass it to the add byte method, which translates the scan code into an option key event. The key event contains which key caused the event and whether it was a press or release event. To interpret this key event, we pass it, pass it to the process key event method, which translates the key event to a character if possible. For example, translates a press, a, hmm, translates a press of the event of the A key to either lowercase a or an uppercase a character, depending on whether the shift key was pressed. With this modified interrupt handler, we can now write text. Okay. It built cargo run. Let's see if we can handle the keyboard. I'll try this hello world here. H E L O world. Bang. Okay. So that was pretty good. We didn't have to write a giant match statement, and I can type a bunch of characters. If I type control characters, what happens? It just comes out as lowercase j. I wonder if there's something else. I wonder if there's something else um, we have to do in order to handle control. Quit. Configuring the keyboard. Keyboard. It's possible to configure some aspects of the PS2 keyboard. For example, wait, I'm gonna just scroll up a little bit more to turn off that animated GIF there. Uh, for example, which scan code set it should use. We won't cover it here because this post is already long enough. And but the OS Dev Wiki has an overview of possible configuration commands. All right, so that's, that's, I guess, where we're going to wrap things up. Let's take a quick look at the configuration commands. Oh, so yeah, you, so you can turn on and off the LEDs, I guess. Um, and different scan sets, you can tell it to use different scan sets. Type Matic Byte. Oh, yeah, so if I, if I hold down a key, does it keep putting a, a, the letter on the screen? It does. So I'm, I'm ho just holding down the D key right now. So it's automatically repeating. And I don't know if that's something that the keyboard is doing or something that's going on um, inside QEMU. Okay. 
I don't want to get lost in the weeds. But that, okay, that wraps up, that wraps up the stream for me. Um, yeah, I, I think we're done. So let's, let's uh, cargo Clippy. Clippy should still be happy, right? Yeah, no changes there. Get status, get diff. All right, so now we're going to do a translate. Yeah. Reads key. Oh, right. The halt loop. Get add. Uh, get commit. Am. Added a halt loop to save CPU cycles, I guess. And added a keyboard handler. Okay. That's that. So the next stream, hopefully tomorrow.